We're talking about application modernization for mainframes for enterprise developers. Um, my name is Ryan Johnson. I am a, one of the senior guys for Facet Consulting and also for Response Systems. Some of you who have used our products will know me. Um, in fact, if anyone in this room doesn't know me, I'll be in trouble. So we're going to talk about mainframe application modernization. This is a, a bit of a redo of a presentation we did last year, but this time around we've actually moved it uh, a bit further along. We've actually got some demonstrable product or solutions and we can walk through the process. Um, so we'll go through the overview, I guess, of what application modernization is for mainframes or mainframe application modernization. The key focus here, I guess, is we're creating new business value from an existing application. Okay? So we're talking about refactoring, rewriting, converting, or replacing a legacy system. And I know that legacy is an interesting term. I know, to, to his credit, Mr. Solomon made the comment that legacy applications are ones that are written and thrown away straight away, whereas most of the larger systems we work on tend to be there for 10 or 20 years. The key focus there is we're looking to realign it with current business needs. Okay, so this is where you, your business demands have changed or your, IT system, or your IT solution is failing. And we'll talk about some of those in a bit. It isn't application migration. Okay, application migration is where you're looking to move to a new platform. Your focus is really upon reducing your infrastructure costs. And I think it's important to differentiate that if you're talking to your organizations or your, your own teams. The challenge with that is you're not actually addressing the core reason for modernization, which is the system doesn't meet the requirements today. Okay. Characteristics of a mainframe application, most of you should know that. I'm pretty sure you're all on mainframes. They're really big. They are generally systems of record. These are mission critical applications. These aren't things that capture, I don't know, logins for timesheets and stuff like that. These are significant systems which organizations depend upon. They've been around a long time and they're quite complex. You know, these things were built 10, 15, 20, 30. We actually had a system that was built 40 years ago we were looking at earlier this year. And they've grown, they're organic. They're not structured, they're not managed. They've just bolted on stuff as they've gone over the years, okay? Outcome of that is that you don't really have any documentation, you don't have any test plans. These are large monolithic applications that work, but they're kind of an unknown. They're a black box. We talked about these drivers, business demands. Your app economy is driving faster time to market. You've heard all about this in the last couple of days through your keynotes and the other presentations that it's quicker, faster, cheaper, get it done yesterday, it's agile, it's all those new things that are saying we don't have time for these six, 12, 24 month cycles. Change is coming quicker, there's new technologies and technologies which are new channels and technologies that you have to then support to reach these customers. You know, you've heard APIs, you've heard mobile, you've heard web, you've all, all those really cool things. IT has been failing the business. We talked about that. It's the complexity of the application means that it's becoming slower and more expensive to make any change whatsoever. And it's that, you know, it's, it's like those big Jenga blocks. You pull out one more block and the whole thing's gonna come down. So you spend more time thinking about it, you have to spend more time testing and supporting it. They do become unmaintainable and you've got these disparate technologies and siloed skill sets. Now, somebody once told me that most organizations usually only build one or two large applications in any technology and then they move on to the next shiny object. Okay, so, um, sorry, I actually can't see you when I'm wearing my glasses but I can see my screen, so if I'm blinking at you a lot it's because I can just see blurry people, so don't stress. Um, and that I think is, is a reasonable truism across most large organizations. So. You have these technologies that are disparate and they're siloed, so you've got two or three people left who actually know anything about the system. Okay, and we're talking about things like COBOL, of course, and many folks say, you know, COBOL programmers are an aging population and they're getting harder and harder to find. Key point there is that your IT is actually constraining your business from delivering results. Strategies around modernization, you know, the elements of these approaches that are successful mean you have to manage risk. You have to acknowledge that the application itself is important. You have to deal with everything. You can't just say, well, we'll pick up the code and we'll leave the data. We have to deal with the whole solution because data is critical as well. You have to accept that complex is normal. These aren't simple systems. If they were simple systems, somebody would have fixed them before. So let's think about different ways you can address application modernization. We're gonna to touch on some of those approaches. You know, there's the rewrite, let's just throw it away and start again. It's very difficult to do these. These aren't small systems. These are systems that are, you know, 50, 100 million dollar builds over 10 or 20 years and to start again, it is not cheap, okay? 
This is my favorite, the shrink wrap package. We'll bring in a COTS, we'll say, yep, this one's a 98% fit, we'll have it plugged in by Friday, it'll deliver the same functionality. Or we'll renew it, we'll modernize, we'll transform, we'll refactor. We take what we've got and we renovate it, just like a house, and we give it the new delivery channels, we make it easy to maintain, etc. Let's consider the pros and cons, I guess, of each of those. Rewrite, yep, that's great, if you can do a green, you know, clean sheet development, start again, do it all again, expensive, you're doing it from scratch, you're gonna have a reasonably long lockdown, and it's gonna take more than five minutes. These tend to be those very large projects which often fail, and they deliver, in terms of a business outcome, for the amount of money you spend, not a significant value to the business. The COT solution, yep, if you've got a really high functional fit, if you're using a common business, if IT isn't a differentiator for your business. And it's important to understand that a lot of organizations and markets these days, IT is the differentiator for your business. IT is what makes you different from your customers, from your competitors. And often sometimes you have to change your business processes to fit the solution, which isn't always a bad thing. If you can do that, then these are reasonably low, they're reasonably fast. The data is usually the issue, having to migrate across, and you're gonna have a reasonable amount of lockdown while you transition to the new system. The renewal, refactor, rewrite process, reasonably low risk because you're basically building on what you're building on. You can chunk it out and do it in pieces and you can start delivering some value to the business, I guess in a reasonably more timely fashion. Okay, so this is where you've got these large systems, large amount of data, and as I said, you know, your IT is a business differentiator. CAGEN, as I said, we're talking about using CAGEN as an agile development environment. This is a modernization proposal where we're actually moving stuff into CAGEN, so Pretty much everyone in the room here is a CAGEN developer, so we'll whip through this. Developer productivity is higher, scalability is great, it's built for enterprise apps, it's platform independent. Those of you who would have got all that yesterday from Steve. We've done the deployment options, we've done the multi-platforms, works on everything, runs everywhere. It's um, really good, and hopefully it's gonna get better as we move along. So this is where we come to the bit where we're basically talking about, which is being able to automatically complete the picture by moving COBOL into CAGEN via some technology that we're bringing online. We can basically take your COBOL applications which have potentially limited options now for delivery, and we can actually move them into CAGEN, which gives us that flexibility of, of, of target platforms, that flexibility of delivery channels, and it also allows us to potentially consolidate these technologies into a single skill set and infrastructure stack. Gen is a super set of COBOL. You know, you can cover pretty much everything that's in COBOL mainframe within Gen, and then you've also got those extra delivery channels and the ability to move to other deployment and target platforms in a distributed space. And this is basically an automated approach to that. So let's talk a little bit about SDS, Semantic Transformation Shell, which is the technology that we're using to actually transform from COBOL to GEN. Okay. It is automated. We built this, we're talking with CA initially to solve some other problems and we continue to build this from a CA GEN perspective. It's a modeling approach, so it's gonna therefore give you some consistency, some scalability, and we're actually trying to minimize that business change lockout by getting this done as quickly as possible. The technology that we're building this on has been used for probably about 10 or 15 years now on other technologies and we're now bringing it into the gen space. Okay, so let's talk about the process. We're talking a, a, an extraction process where we actually pull out the rules, the data structures, the UIs, etc., from your COBOL stack. We're doing an analysis process and this is being done automatically based on some refactoring rules that we have defined and we can define and customize for the target environment. And then we're actually transforming or generating the CA gen model off the back of that. Extraction, we're basically parsing it, we're validating that its source is COBOL, we're doing a lexical analysis to make sure everything's complete because garbage in, garbage out. And then we're actually creating meta models. So we're actually building object models, we're doing some validation across that. And we can then use that for the subsequent analysis process once we've got it into this meta model framework. From an analysis perspective, we can then actually do some as is analysis. So you can actually look at this from a COBOL perspective and look at the structure and the framework, et cetera. 
and understand what you're actually dealing with. And we actually have some customers who are interested primarily in actually getting to this point in the process in looking at just show me what I've got because quite often they don't even know what parts they want to bring across if they don't understand their system. We can then look at actually structuring this down into presentation business and persistent layers and actually start breaking down the, what it would look like in a CA Gen perspective. You can do some deep dive, you can start looking at the flows, you can understand the crawling hierarchies, you can understand the persistence and the interfaces and the patterns around that as well. And then as we transition this across into CA Gen, we can actually do what we call a semi-autonomous architectural restructure. You know, we've putting processing in there to see, do things like eliminating go-to statements, addressing recursion, those redefines on the data structures, you know, pulling out those technical artifacts where you've got things like, you know, native kick statements and DB2 parameters, et cetera, that are embedded within your COBOL, which when you move into a CA Gen space, because we've abstracted that up, it's actually something you don't need, okay? We're also looking at tidying up the application. So, you know, if you were to just do a like-for-like -like sausage factory, you might have every sectional paragraph becomes a CA Gen action block. That doesn't really map out when you're in CA Gen when you've got thousands of action blocks which do three things. So there's the ability to start merging some of those functionalities up. And then also you can start doing things like decomposition by identifying those component like layers you want to pull apart as well. The key thing here is that the focus is on trying to take your big ball of mud and deliver a well-structured application architecture. Transformation itself, basically builds you a CA Gen model, gives you data structures, gives you procedures, your action blocks, does your UIs. And the goal here is 100% consistency check free, CA Gen models, which you can then generate. They may not be structured the same, but the point there is that they are functionally equivalent, which is really what you want at the end of this process. Okay, so let's go and have actually have a look at it. just swap things around a bit because we're running on two different screens at the moment, aren't we? Um, should be seeing me. Okay. Let's fire this up. Okay, there it is fired. Okay, so this is an Eclipse-based product. We run this in Eclipse framework. Um, all the analytics are being done under the covers in Eclipse. We're using Eclipse um, EMF modeling, et cetera, to be able to present this stuff and process it through. Um, and the goal there is it actually makes it easier for us to pull stuff in. So we've got a couple of examples here. Um, there's a Kix example, which has a CICS example, which has some actual uh, BMS screen maps. Um, so if we go down here, we'll actually have a look at the resource pool. Um, I've actually pulled a few in here to save us going through the, you know, here's one I prepared earlier. We have some screen maps. For those of you who are familiar with reading screen maps, this is just BMS stuff generated out. We have some programs, transactions. Um, this is actually a multi-screen transaction in one load module, um, which, you know, is something we're seeing quite often. You've got all your other bits and pieces in there. You've got code, et cetera, and some subroutines, which we're actually calling as well. Um, I believe this example does a little bit of vSAM and DB2. So we've actually dealt with both sides of that conversation because they're quite often the ones we want. Um, from a process perspective, um, we're effectively just um, generating our EMF process, uh, which is going to run across, creates a model for us. Um, we're then allowed to basically generate what we call a COBOL to gen design, um, which allows us to we actually use a seed model, so we don't have to go and build all the CA Gen objects. We just generate a sample model as a starting point, and we use that as our starting point, and from then we can extend out, um, which means it lines up. You can actually compress all your one-time action blocks up and down in an inline expand. Um, I'm going to run this here. It's going to quickly rip along. Okay. So now we've taken COBOL, which is over here, and now we're actually building out a map for what looks like a this is starting to look very much like a CA Gen application. We've got you know, procedure steps, we've got entities. Um, we can actually look through these and actually um, do some processing as we go along. For example, here, this is just a flat file. We're actually going to allocate what the ID should be for that table. And we can specify that by keys and columns. Um, we can actually look at some of the packaging on some of these things. 
Um, some of these here we can actually um, decide to make external or not because obviously there are some parts that um, you don't want to roll into your CAGN processing. Um, for example, I know this particular one here has some recursive coding in it, which CAGN doesn't support, but Cobalt does. So in this case here, we're actually going to roll this up and actually make it an external process so we can map that out. Um, and other ones we can basically work through. If you want to, you can actually look at it and see what the actual code looks like. So this is what that layer is there, and that comes in here. And we, we're, we're building this functionality out so you can do some analysis and you can make some of these decisions as you go through the process. Okay, so the, the goal here is that, you know, at the moment this is a tool becoming productized, but you can actually take this and you can actually look at it, you can make some decisions about what you want to do with it, you can you know, merge functionality and action blocks at this level in the model before you actually generate the CHN code. Um, you can understand the layers and structure. You'll see here we actually do, you know, impact analysis. This action block uses this action block. Um, you can look at that process and say, okay, so where is this coming from? What is contained in? Um, let me bring up some properties here for these things. You know, you can look at how you want to package it. You can specify, well, you know, this will be a CAGN action block. This will be an external. Um, we do what's called an inline expand, which means you can roll it up to the consumer if you decide that this is a single use one. And I think I zipped through the first part where you can actually say do that automatically, just compress everything back up. Um, you don't always want to do that because you may quite often find that um, even though it's only a single use process, it may be something that should be really externalized or it may be something you want to use elsewhere in the process. Um, you can specify your packaging. We have some naming standards that are sort of built into the process, but you can actually go and modify your packaging on the fly at this point in time as well. Um, so you can tidy this up on the way through. Um, in this case here, uh, we've got work sets. You can merge some of these up as well. There are some processing to sort of flatten out the work sets and manage those. Um, you can understand, I guess, to a certain extent um, where they're called. I don't think I have that in here. You can maintain the names of them, change things here. So the goal here is that you can do some of that semi-autonomous modification and management as you go through. Um, and then when at the end of the day, when you're finished with this, I'm just going to quickly push through the other side and we can look at a batch process as well. You can basically generate CAGN code. So in this case here, we're actually going to generate a model. We want to actually leave the COBOL code in as note statements because from a reference perspective, you may want to actually understand, understand what you brought through. If you want, you can show the CICS, you can show the SQL, you can ignore those unused processes. You can actually do some of this data modification synchronization. Now that's the other issue that we find when we bring COBOL across, which is that um, you know, your redefines, et cetera, where you've got processing in your COBOL, where you've got like an 01 or a 10 or a 15 or something, and you modify one and it has an impact on the other one. It doesn't really work that well in gen, but we actually have a process where you can actually flatten that out and sort of deal with it as well. Um, so let's just go ahead and generate this. Um, so this is basically gonna build these out. We're talking, you know, 46 action blocks and procedures in this particular implementation, just quickly banging this out. Um, while I'm sitting here, let me just open up toolset. Um, and that's done. So in this case here, demo CICS, bring it in. We've actually mapped this out as two screens, as an inverted flow because there's two screen flows between the two of them. Um, each of these have the VMS maps already built out now. It's generating what looks like V270. And it's clean. Um, let's pick that up from the VMS map definitions. It's generating the screens functionally in there. Um, you can run a consistency check. That's where I do that deep breath and hit the go button. It's come across clean. We can open up some of the code. Um, it looks like CAJ. You know, it's it's still a bit COBOL-ish. We're still working on tidying up some of the bits and pieces of that, but you know, it's got use statements in it. It's got, um, let me go and find a DB2 statement. Read employee DB2. And we're down here, we've got a few note statements in there. We're into the actual read statements. We're moving in from um, return reason codes to your exit state, so we're making this more like a CAGN program. Okay? Um, and this will generate up and run along. You know, some of these aren't pretty, but it's CAGN code. So this, this is that process of taking all your COBOL, squirting it into CAGN, doing some transformation on the way through, and at the other end of it, you get CAGN code, which gives you that starting point to, um, to move forward. Uh, we've also got a batch process there. Let me see if I can go open that up. I'll just open up the model for the batch. Um, let's just go and open one. 
come up. Um, this is one I generated about 10 minutes ago. Same deal, batch program. Some structures in there, just rolls through, processes way down, walking around. As I said, you know, we've injected the, the existing COBOL in there, so if you want to understand the process and do some mapping, you can drop those out when you're happy with them, and then that's sort of translating into your wall, et cetera, and your, your standard CA gen constructs. Um, with the actual, coming back to the actual um, transformation process, um, let me bring this back up here. Um, as I said, we can actually look at it from both sides. So in this case here, we're looking at what we call a, an equal model, which is your, um, your CA gen target. Um, we also keep what's effectively a, um, an analysis of the COBOL side of things as well. So for example, if you want to look at that, you can actually, um, I think just, uh, where am I here? You can just open this up. Um, and this basically gives you your as-is analysis. So you can actually pull this out and you can look at the structure of what it looks like in that sense and you can walk through this. You can understand the framework. And we find that having it all in a single place means that you can be doing your analysis of your COBOL if you want to tweak and tune and play with things on the same way through. If you're wanting to understand structures and frameworks in this place here, this is that same process here. You've got some you know, standard structures, programs, if you're wanting to understand some actual impact analysis, let me just pull this up here. Um, you can actually walk through that. As I said, you can see where everything is. You can see where it's used, etc. You can see reference points. Um, let's go bring up some properties. You can actually see what the source would look like for those fragments if you want to. We've actually done some initial complexity analysis as well. Somebody asked for something like that. So you can get more and more reporting on your as-is analysis as well. And the nice thing is because we've got this in a minor model, we can actually extend that reporting capability very easily. So if you say, hey, I want something else, it's easy enough to bang in there if you want to actually understand. Um, let me go find some working storage. Uh, let's see if I can find one here. You can actually show where it's being referenced. You know, you can say, yep, let me see this piece, let me see this piece, let me see this piece. You can walk through and understand impact analysis as well and say, look, you know, what am I actually looking for here? The key here is that it's giving you that point of reference where you can do some analysis and understand what you've got. And then as you port that across and you transform it into CA gen, you can actually say, well, I want to make this this or I want to merge these things together. So as I said, you know, this is COBOL into gen. It's pretty nice. We like the fact that it compiles and builds gen code that's functionally equivalent. Um, and we're continuing to refine and improve it out to the point where it's uh, I guess supporting more and more requirements. Are there any questions about the demo? I know it's a little fast and we're pushing through. Um, I guess my goal is to try and get you guys out of here as early as possible because it is a long day. Everybody's excited. Steve. Steve's thinking about that executive centre, aren't you? Yes. Yes, yes. I don't blame you, mate. Um, I've got to get on a plane myself this afternoon. Okay, so that's, that's it. It works. Generates gen from COBOL functional equivalent, does batch, does online, gives that starting point. Question? Yes, sir. So is the transformation process done at the Eclipse plugin? Is anything required to be installed, say, if you're on the HD in the mainframe, you get your cobalt from the mainframe? We just suck the source down into this at you the moment. The yeah. And we've, we've used routines and utilities that'll extract that and bundle it up and ship it down. So we can load it in. So if I was using the Eclipse plugin for Endeavor, Yes, yes, you could. I like the way you think you should be a product manager. <laughs> but yes, and that's one of the reasons why we like this in Eclipse, because it is, it's is—it's got that capability of integration. And then what do you think you're at for conversions for automatic today? There's a lot more statements that are supported in the languages than gen support. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're going to try to throw those in stream, but do you think you're at a 90%, 95%? Where are we at in terms of grammar and syntax, Mustafa? I mean, uh, I can't give a percentage, but uh, if there uh, some commands in the whole language which are not exactly sent in Jen, yeah. and we try to uh, open an external action, let's say. Yeah, so we can generate the, we leave the source in your app.
At the moment, it's external, but we could look at the in-stream as well if we wanted to. Yeah. For this iteration, we're basically just dropping them in note statements. So if you wanted to, you could just add them in. Yeah, I guess the, the, the first point is, and, and this is one of those to and fro's about in-stream versus external, if it's something that's used commonly, then potentially it's best as a single process rather than having to embed it in each and every one. And that's, I guess, one of the drawbacks of in-stream is that you've got to put it in every action block. Um, so I guess the starting point was external, uh, but it's not a significant issue to make it in-stream. And that's probably on the, the backlog of things to look at with capacity. Yeah, we have a backlog. We use Agile Central. That's a customer conversation, I guess. Yeah. 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 The approach we tend to do is POC, prove out the capability, um, accepting that not every you're not going to find every problem at every point. So there's always going to be the extra ones, obviously, because you know millions of lines of COBOL means that occasionally you're going to find a wart you've never seen before. But it's about proving that confidence and working with the customer to come up with a, a testing strategy that supports, suits them. You know, the, the the big challenge, I guess, is it's a little different from from what they're used to is that they're really doing a functional equivalency test. They're not, yeah, white box is useless here because it's a completely different transformation process or technology stack. So the cost is still in the validation. Cost is always in the validation. validation is required. Yeah. Rewrite Just, yeah. It's, it's a little like the CA gen migration process. So if you do an upgrade or something, you know that if it's generating the same code consistently every time it seems to say, oh, object. Once you've done some, you know, initial risk mitigating analysis on maybe key problem areas, domain boundaries, etc., confidence increases. Then you've got a high degree of comfortable that I'm going to continue to squirt the same thing through. So the differentiator, say, between this or, you know, a, a thousand monkeys working away in a shop somewhere beavering on rewrites, is that I'm reasonably certain that this monkey's going to cut the same code every time it sees the same process. It just hasn't had a bad day or he's fallen asleep at the wheel. So you know, that's nice and it's fast too. If we see something. We've actually got a round trip capability that if you see something in the, in, the, in the gen model and you don't like it or you want to change the structure or the framework, you can refactor it and we can basically swing it back through and adjust the transformation on the fly. So you're allowed, that's that shaping process as you go through. So it's not, it's certainly not AI, but it's, it allows us a bit more of a learning capability to understand where things don't quite line up the way we want them to, in that sense. But that was a really good question. Uh, it's usually the one that pops up. This is great. Yep, quicker time to market, yep. Repeated process helps to lower the risk, but there's still the risk. You know, and that's usually the big challenge with conversation with customers. So. But there's less risk. There is less risk, yes. So less risk means a less required investment in mm -hmm. certification and validation. Yep, I agree, 100%. So. Okay. We are working on various questions that we might approach January to We're trying to build in some self-validation throughout the process, um, but as you said, you know, the challenge is that because it's really functional equivalency testing, it's a little bit trickier. And you know, at the end of the day, the customer knows their, their application better than anyone else does, so they really need buy-in on that as well. But yeah, more than happy if you've got some thoughts on some of the test tool integrations, we'd be more than happy to look at plugging those into. We are happy to look at those. It may be that we have to put a, a, a data layer in there as an external. Um, and I know we've had this conversation previously with customers looking to manually move to Gen from IMS. Um, does IMS not have an ODBC as well? It doesn't have what? Does IMS have an ODBC connector as well? What? IMS. I don't know if it's a connector. Uh, does it have an ODBC connector of some oh, sort or a relational one? No, okay, yeah. No, no, I was thinking of a different product. 
But um, yeah, so in that case, you'd probably put a data layer in um, or a transformation layer. We do have other technology, we have extensions on this which are really about database transformation as well. So taking IMS and moving it to DB2. So we've done that, and we've done that in COBOL before. Any other questions? Mr. Pines. You generated a, a new model. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, this initial iteration, as you said, it's basically generating into a new model in the past. Um, as we move through this, it's going to be a case of, um, you'll saw that, you see that I actually loaded up a seed model as I started that, which is just your base model. Um, so extensions of that would be, we'll have it, I load up a seed model with my database definition already in place, or my database definition in my work set. Um, and then eventually this will become a, a cumulative process, you know, so you can potentially round trip and you can preserve some of these activities as you go through settings, preferences, focus points to say, next time I see this again, I'm going to apply those transformation patterns as I see that. Yeah. So, yeah, at the moment it's a service orient it's a service delivery, so, you know, you ship the code, we ship the models. Of course, then, if the names are aligned and everything else, then, it, you know, the power of gen, it's an adoption and go straight in. So that's a nice aspect around that. Yeah, we can pull those back in and, and yeah, like I said, well, we've got that round trip refactoring process. Gen actually blocks. Where go the other I'm over there now. Yeah, uh, we demo kicks. Yeah, let me come back up. I'm in work sets. So we can show you that. We can show you what it will look like in gen, et cetera, and you can play with it as well. So. So we built that round trapping in primarily for that refactoring conversation. If I give you a gen model and I look at it, and then I tweak it and I tune it, then I can slip that back in and do the analysis of what was different on the way through and I can adjust my transformation process to say, okay, now I can fix that. So the next time it's gonna come through, it's gonna look exactly like you want it to look like. Okay, so that's how we sort of POC our way through that process, iron out those issues and then bring it back in. But yeah, initial implementation is into a model. Longer term is into the new model or there's a, you know, at the moment it's a step through, do an adoption, tidy it up. Okay. That's it. Well, thank you guys. I know it was a small crowd and you've probably mostly seen this before and you're all gen developers. So I guess you know, the nice thing is if you've got guys with COBOL and you've got a gen base, there's an opportunity here for you to say, hey, why don't we take a COBOL and push it into gen? I know that sounds like a horror story for some organisations, but you know, it's the same argument, you know. Steve just got done telling you guys yesterday how it's not legacy, it's legendary. So let's see if we can't make legendary better. So. <laughs> but yes. Okay, well that was that. Let me just wrap through the usual rubbish on the tail end. Um, but yeah, well there we go. Thank you folks. I appreciate your time and I hope that you have a... Uh, sorry? Please take a water bottle because I don't want to lug them all up to Minneapolis this evening. <laughs>